Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Kaylin, alcoholic? Yes. Oh, Lord. Um, a lot of people staring at me. <laughs> um, so, I have my mom here tonight, which is really special for me. I... This is my first time, like, ever speaking at a meeting, and it would be one of the biggest meetings that I really go to. Um, I also have my sponsor sisters, my sober living, and my sponsor here today. Um, without any of them, I would not be here. Um, I should be dead or in prison right now, you know, and um, I grew up in a small town called Youngstown, Ohio, and... Um, yeah, I don't know. Like when I was younger, I I felt as though I didn't really fit in. I had a liver transplant when I was one and a half, and uh, it wasn't like it was. I had like a liver disease and stuff like that, and um, you know, I just I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. I had I have a big scar on my stomach. It, like I would wear one piece bathing suits. I just never felt you know, normal. Um, growing up, I would always say, like, I'm never going to, because I have a lot of um, addicts on both sides of my family, on my mom and my dad's side. And, you know, I would always tell myself, like, I'm not going to become an addict or an alcoholic. And I was against all of that, against even the smell of cigarettes, like, you know, just everything. And, um, Around, let's see, I think I was like 17 or 18, I started smoking weed uh, right when I got out of high school, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, I started drinking, drinking, but not like a lot. I would, you know, drink here and there, and then I... um, I started drinking, like, heavily when I was, like, older, but around that, around 17 or 18, I started smoking weed, then it turned to pills, and, um, I was doing, like, mushrooms and acid all the time, um, just kind of dabbled in any little thing that I could find, and, um, I don't know, like, what kind of what kind of triggered that, um, growing up, I was, like, bullied a lot, um, I would have, like, friends one year, no friends the next year, it was just kind of, like, back and forth, and, uh, my, my dad was also, like, very mentally, emotionally, and physically abusive towards me, which, didn't help my, like, self-esteem or self-love, um, so I really struggled with that. I felt like, you know, like, we were close, but we weren't. We were close when I was, like, younger, and then as I started getting older, I have a smart-ass mouth, and, you know, (laughs) so, um, he didn't like that very much, but, um, yeah, I just, I always, like, I, I look up to my mom, like, in so many ways, um, she was almost 19 when she had me, and, you know, working full-time in school and taking care of me, I was sick for a very long time, um, I had to take, like, anti-rejection meds for a while, and I was supposed to take them my whole life, um, they eventually, like, weaned me off of it, and, um, yeah, I, like, when I, and then when I turned about, I would say, nine, 19, 20, I, by this time, I was selling pounds of weed, coke, mushrooms, acid, uh, pills, all kinds of stuff. And, like, I remember my mom, like, finding a pill on the floor and, like, messaged me about it. And she's like, what the hell is this? And, like, just, and then, like, you could smell weed on me from a mile away and it was just like 
I, I wasn't able to hide it, you know, and I, and I thought that I was good at it, but I really wasn't. And, um, you know, I, I guess, like, I just, I wanted to fit in, you know, I wanted to have a big friend group and then I became like a people pleaser. Um, and I still kind of am. Um, I, it's hard for me to not like want to be there for people and help people. Um, that's like a really big struggle of mine. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just, I really wanted to, people to like me. Um, I ended up you know, being with this woman that was 11 years older than me, and um, she she was a cokehead and alcoholic, and that I got caught selling drugs and stuff like that, so I couldn't smoke weed anymore. And um, she would she told me that I got like coke out of your system in like three days, so I started doing that like every day for about two years. Came out here in 2019. Um, and then I came back in 2020. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know, like, this time, like, throughout my, like, coming in and out of the rooms, um, I've had to learn, like, contrary action for me is, like, a really big one. Um, I hate doing shit that I don't want to do, but at the end of the day, like, I have to do it or else I'm not going to fucking be sober, you know? I... <laughs> I, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, fuck. Like, I, I, I did not want to do the 12 steps. I didn't believe in it. I, you know, didn't think that it would work for me. I was like, you know, for a while I was like, if I get coke out of my system, I'll be good on alcohol, you know, and like, that's, that's not true. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, um, you know, and, like, I would get, like, a sponsor, I would do step one, and then just fall off the face of the earth, and and this went on for, this has been going on for, like, five years up until this point, and I honestly don't know what I would do without you, May, and, like, all my sponsee sisters, my sober living, like, (sighs) um, yeah, I, I really should not be standing here right now, Last year, I got two DUIs, seven days apart. <laughs> and then my prior was, I I came out here in 2019, and, you know, I was in that stage where if I stopped doing coke and I, I could start, I could drink, right? I was in denial. And I get home, and seven days later, I get a DUI. And then last year, I got two DUIs in seven days. So I guess seven is not a lucky number for me at all um some people you know that's their number but not for me it's it's not not good um so i'm currently dealing with that right now um i just went to jail like last month for one of them and i'm just I'm trying to, you know, give it my all this time and actually do the step work. And there are times where I, you know, get stagnant and I'm like in self, you know, and um, it's just it's not healthy. Like I need to start thinking about others, but like in a healthy way, you know, um, I like to sit in self-pity a lot. You know, poor me. Um, I'm so used to playing the victim in any situation that comes my way. Um, but I'm on step four right now, column two, and I'm slowly starting to get back into the groove of things. I kind of stopped for a little while there and, um, may knows how to get under, like, get to the point and, like, get on my ass about shit. So, um, she's very intimidating, (laughs) 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 but I love you. Um, Yeah, so, you know, if you're new here, um, stay. It really, it really does work. And like, I I know that I only have 90, like a little over 90 days right now, but, um, you know, I've, I've had, you know, a decent amount of time, but around like eight months or so. Um, and, you know, each, 
each time, like, when I would relapse, I would get so down on myself, but each time, like, I, I became a different person each time. I've learned from my mistakes, you know, and I'm able to be the person that I want to be today. I don't think about, you know, using, you know, and today I respond instead of react. I have really bad anger issues. Um, it, it's, it's not pretty. I, I like to fight when I drink and it's just not, not good. Um, so like just being able to manage my anger is like really, really, really big for me. Um, it's, and like, I'll, I'll like flip out on somebody like over the littlest thing. And then I'll have to like walk outside, smoke a cigarette. And I'm like, damn. I was a fucking asshole, like, you know, um, I, I instantly regret it, and then I have to go back and apologize for it, and I, tr like, now I try to, I try to look at it from a different perspective, like, you know, if someone comes off a certain way, or, you know, they say something that I don't like, you know, maybe they're going through something, you know, um, maybe they're having a rough time, and they, they don't realize, you know, how they're coming off. And so um, I try to, like, sympathize with people because I know with me, like, when I'm having a bad day, sometimes I project my feelings on to other people, which is not good. It's not healthy, and that's not a good way to make friends either. Um, <laughs> a, a lot of people are like, oh, my God, like, she's just an angry person, like, you know, and I'm perceived as, like, like, intimidating or, like, very blunt and to the point, and, you know, to an extent, like, you have to be assertive, you know, and, like, express your wants and needs in a healthy manner, but when you take it past that point, and it's just, like, no one wants to be around that, you know, um, I sure as hell don't, and, uh, yeah, you know, I've, I've realized over the years that, like, I need to do something different, and by doing these steps, it has changed my life, you know, I'm not getting everything that I want, you know, right away, but there are, like, I'm getting things slowly, and if I get things too fast, that's when shit goes downhill, you know, I take advantage of that, and, um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so like I said, if you're new, actually do the steps, get a sponsor. You know, meetings are not going to keep you sober. They're not. Um, I've tried it. It doesn't work. Um, when I fall out of my program and I stop talking to my sponsor, I don't do the steps, I relapse. So hold on to your seat and, you know, just just give it a shot, honestly. Like, it will be worth it in the end, you know. Um, there's a lot of people dying out there right now due to fentanyl and everything else. So, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know what else to say. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Astrid. I'm definitely an alcoholic. Uh, I want to thank Steve and the group for asking me to come share my experience, strength, and hope. Welcome to the newcomers. Congratulations to chip takers. Birthdays. Birthdays. Birthdays are badass. And um, I loved your share. And you came a long, long, long way. And you fought hard for what you have. And I had to learn in here that my life has to become important to me. And if my life isn't going to become important to me, it's not going to become important to anybody else. Yeah. Um, I hope I can say something tonight that can help somebody. Um, the 12th step says that I try to carry the message and to practice the principles. Try to practice the principles in all of my affairs. I got a lot of affairs. Sometimes I have to limit my affairs because I can't practice the principles in them. Like this young lady said, we have anger problems, parking lot therapy to get, you know, yeah. They, they, they call security on me years and years of sobriety. That's what happens. So I need this today like I needed it in the very beginning. I have 18 years of physical sobriety. And I, yeah, you know, I'm really grateful. Um, 
that you talked about childhood because I often feel that that's not woven into the fabric enough. And I'm not saying everybody in here comes from childhood trauma, but I would bet 97 to 98% of the people come from some kind of hell where we were restless, irritable, and discontent before we ever picked up a drink. Um, I think that that is more and more prevalent as in our society as time goes on. Uh, there are very few parents that stay together. Children are shuffled all over the place. Now we see people coming in whose parents were completely meth heads their entire childhood. I mean, it's just unbelievable the stuff that's happening. Our society is being fractured. The family system is being fractured. And um, we're herd people. We're herd instinct people. You know, we're, we're, we, we, we have a group soul. We like to be together. We like mommy and daddy and comfortness. And there's now generations of parents that just don't know how to comfort their children. So my mother's a German war survivor and she grew up in the war in Germany. The war started when she was two and I think it ended when she was like 12, something like a 10 year war. Anyway, you know, she starved in the whole nine yards. People say because she's a German, wasn't she a Nazi or didn't she have Food. It doesn't go like that. Like they didn't know that, you know, millions of Jews are being burned. They didn't know anything about anything, you know, and there's very little food, very little stores, very little anything. And just this rigid, rigid, fearful, you know, um, background for her. And my father, you know, he, he's American. They met while he was in the army over there. Anyway, my mother's anger and fury and Germanic ways really did damage to her children. So I'm going to get into some psychopathy, psychopathy just for a second. There are true parents and there are false parents. My mommy doesn't know how to be a true parent. So she competes with her children and she pits them against one another. And none of her children can overachieve or have anything that's good. She doesn't want what was best for us. And it took me years and years for me to articulate this. I do not blame my mother that I'm standing here at the podium. At some point, I have to take responsibility for the disease that centers in my mind, in my subconscious mind. But in the beginning, as I start to pick stuff apart, I begin to follow the crumb trail back to the witch's house. How did this all begin? <laughs> and so for me, I look at my defects in character, and I think that there's a big myth in Alcoholics Anonymous, and the myth is this. Let me sponsor you. What happened when you took the first drink? Hold on, Turbo. Hold the fuck on. <laughs> What happened when you took the first drink and decided to throw your life away? Because it doesn't happen to everyone. And there are very few people that were triggered by the phenomenon of craving with the very first drink. Most of us were restless, irritable, and discontent, came from some kind of hell, had all kinds of issues in our tissues, can't sleep, can't deal, can't eat, can't get along with others, constantly fighting, in some kind of fear, in some kind of depression, all over the place. ADHD, they call it today. I call it untreated alcoholism. And so there's something fundamentally wrong. And for me to think that I'm not bodily and mentally different from my fellows is the biggest myth of all. Like, i got to really get down to causes and conditions and what drove me here. And so I look back and I can see that. I just wasn't right. I mean, I just wasn't right. I do not believe I was born that way, but I believe that by the time I was three or four years old, they say the personality is formed in the first t seven years. It absolutely is. So the fundamental aspects of the human being and their ability to self-soothe and their ability to have something like delayed gratification. Everybody sits at the table. Please don't touch the food until we say grace. The alcoholic kid's going to snatch something. He cannot control himself. And the one that's laughing the most snatched the most food. You know, that's just the way it goes. You can, you can relate. And why is this so valuable? Because I keep inventorying and searching and inventorying and searching. And for me, I literally had to go all the way back to the primary ecosystem over and over and over. Because when I start to inventory, and I start to look at my defects of character, the way I judge people, the way I'm impatient, the way I want what I want when I want it, the way I'm going to love, my, I, you're going to love me, but I hate you. You better be nice to me. You better invite me to your party, but fuck you. I hate you, you know? <laughs> and I, I look at that and I can see that that's some kind of armor that I had to wear from the very beginning. That's some kind of armor I had to put on from the very beginning because there was no soft nest to land in. So I want to be loving. I want to be warm. 
I want to give a good hug. And people always say, man, you're a terrible hugger. I'm like, yeah, yeah, got to go, got to go, got to go. Come here, give me your heart. And I've had to learn so much about intimacy, about eye contact, about closeness, about loving people, about allowing them into my life way later. I'm 63 years old and I'm still a work in progress. There's never perfection. It's always progress, 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 progress. And sometimes it's three steps up, two steps back. You know, it's not a straight line. Anybody that's been in here for years and years and years, you just wait until you hit a fucking brick wall 10, 15, 20 years into sobriety and you've decided for a while, I hate AA. I don't want to go back. I don't want to sponsor. I don't want to go to meetings. It happens to everyone. It happens to the best of us. You know, hold on to your seat, make your life important to you and really hope and pray that you don't get thirsty enough to throw your life completely away because it's bad enough to be dry. So dry, you could spontaneously combust or blow the ceiling off of this place. But let me tell you, once you pour liquor on it, they say the average relapse is anywhere from four to seven years and only two to 5% of alcoholics ever take a five year cake. So most people are revolving door people and that's tough. That's a tough message to hear, isn't that? That's a, that's a tough message to hear. Only two to five percent ever get a five year cake. What's not being transmitted? Maybe, just maybe, there's a little too much drunkalog and not enough solution. I believe that the Alcoholics Anonymous message is getting watered down. My, my home group is prime time. I don't think we're the be all end all. I didn't raise Clancy's flag or clean up any dog shit to get here. I don't think that my grand sponsor is the be all end all. My home group is actually Saturday night at this exact podium. Also, the women's meeting downstairs on Monday evening. The men stag in this room, 8 o'clock Monday nights. And we talk about solution. And we talk about untreated alcoholism. And we talk about the main part of the illness actually centering in the alcoholic's mind rather than their body. And that I'm going to be the same exact woman drunk as I am sober. What does that mean? You know, I take away the liquor and it's but a symptom. But I still hate you. I still don't want to suit up and show up. I still think the meanest thoughts when you cross me. You know, when you cross me, I want to see your house light on fire, and I want to hear you scream, and I'm going to get me some fucking marshmallows, and I'm going to make s'mores while you burn in hell. And the punishment never, ever, ever fits the crime. Like, the fury is outrageous. This comes from a child that has not been seen or heard. I need to say that again. I'm not blaming my parents. I'm blaming the environment. This comes from a child that over and over and over put, held down a spring and shoved it into the basement, held down a spring and shoved it into the basement. When you put a child in an environment where the child is not seen and heard, There's all kinds of defective things that can happen, all kinds of personality disorders. Sometimes you get an overeater, a stuffer. They're totally out of touch with their feelings. They can't really even remember the trauma. Then maybe you get an A-type personality and everything has to be just lined up and perfect, just straight. If I just keep it all in control, if I touch every doorknob this way and that way before I get out of the house, we're going to be safe. We're going to be safe. And there's this over-managing and controlling of the environment because the environment they came from was so out of control. And then there's us. Oh, noisy good fellows, fucking bitches and witches, sluts and nuts. It's on and cracking. <laughs> Rules aren't for me. I'm going into your purse. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm crawling out of windows. Tell me not to have sex and I'm going to have it. Tell me not to touch it. I'm going to touch it. Get in my parents' face. I can remember getting in my dad's face, and he would punch me and hit me. And I remember being in so much pain, and I'd look at him, and I'd go, that didn't hurt. (laughs) For real. Like, that's not normal. I don't know what that is, but I'll tell you what a good psychiatrist will tell you. A good psychiatrist will tell you that our anger is our will to fight and we are actually the most treatable people when we walk into recovery, when we walk into a psychiatric room because the overweight stuffer that can't remember anything anymore is so out of touch that we can't even get that person to get angry. Us? Oh, fucking feelings are right here on the surface. Let me tell you how it went down. Which, in the end, that liability turns out to be one of my greatest assets. In the end, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to compost that, and I'm going to turn that into gold. But there's a whole lot of stuff that happens along the way, and so many people never even arrive 
in this place, linoleum floors and metal chairs, think of it as grace if you came in here. I don't care if you fell through the roof, you know. It's, it's somehow that you wound up in here, it's God's grace. It really, self could never do this. I, I really, 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 truly believe that. I remember not Mother Teresa, but St. Teresa of Avila, she would say, her will to even get on her knees and pray only comes from God. That that willingness is grace. That she couldn't even do that. I'd rather be smoking crack or blowing my brains out or I don't even know what somewhere else, you know. That's what self would say. There's got to be something better than in here in Dickens on a Friday night, 8 o'clock with this room stuffed to the gills, you know. I thought I was going to have a husband in like some big house with an island cutting board in the center <laughs> and stuff baking in the oven and my grandkids and my dogs running around. I don't even have a dog or an island or an oven or anything I'm lucky to be here I'm really lucky to be here so I started drinking at a really early age and I would say you know I started drinking at 12 and I would say by the time I was 16 it was on now I'm drinking like every single day every day I remember every New Year's I would think to myself even as a teenager before I was in my 20s I would think I did not miss one single day of drinking this whole year with the flu, with anything. It didn't matter. Man, I was so hardy. I was like on and cracking, ripping and running. And I still had all these ideas of like how life is going to be and I'm going to go to college and I'm going to meet a great man and we're going to have a hedge fund and we're going to raise pashmina goats and I'm going to breastfeed with my tits out to here. And everything's going to be amazing. And I missed the boat after boat after boat after boat. You know, relationships problems like the diagnosis my picker is broken to say the least like like there needs to be written an entire Britannica library on my picker is broken <laughs> because what I'm attracted to mimics my childhood trauma my dad was a spanker and a beater and he was also a PhD got his bachelor's at Harvard his master's at Columbia and his PhD at Princeton so I want somebody smart but I also want you to knock the shit out of me and if you haven't had a restraining order I'll make sure you get one if you haven't hit a woman I'll be sure that happens before we're finished you know you laugh but this is the truth for my life this is the truth for my life. This is who self is when they say, we must be rid of the self or it kills us. God, I offer this self thing to you. Build with me. Do with me as you will relieve me of the bondage of this self. You know, any life run on self can hardly be a success. I To make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it, 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 it him, as I understood that there's a power and self is such a big power. We're such a big power, man. You give this girl a liver transplant and you start calling her names. And I'm telling you, it's on a fucking crack and she's got armor. And somebody's going to get their ass kicked on the kindergarten field with her little metal lunchbox. No joke. No joke. No joke. I get it. I totally I identify. Like, you know, if we don't if we don't stand up for something, we'll lay down for everything. And in the end, I don't even know what I'm standing up for. It's like... My personality just shifts and out comes untreated alcohol. You want a fucking piece of me? You know, like the humanness, the femininity, my true self leaves and something else takes over. It's like a, it's like a partial possession. That's really what it is. Untreated alcoholism is. It is a parasite. I really believe that it is a partial possession. I believe that we go to sleep enough that a window cracks open and something gets in there. And I don't think I'm being sunk by a disease over and over and over again. And I start to look at my repetitive thoughts and I can see that 95% of them have been there a long, long, long time. I'm not going to make it. I'm unlovable. I'm a loser. I'm ugly. You know, I don't have enough money. I, I should be somewhere else. Why are they? This and that. All that comparing continuous. Stay, stay away from social media. Stay away from Instagram. You're just going to want to blow your brains out. There's always someone smarter and hotter than us. Get over it. Get over it. Get over the self. You know, that's one of the biggest problems. So 
Anyway, as time goes on, for so many people, things get worse and never better, and the disease begins to escalate, and it begins to take over every aspect of my life, and in case you didn't know, alcohol is the classic depressive, so it wipes out all the serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, all the happy hormones get completely wiped out, and every morning we wake up and we want to kill ourselves, and every morning we wake up and say, I'm never going to do this again, and somewhere around 5 or 6 o'clock every single night, we change our mind. I don't change my mind. My mind gets changed for me by a disease that's on and cracking, by a disease that the mental obsession is so strong that no human power, only a power greater than self, there's, you know, unaided will. It is no joke. The thing is on me. It's all over me, and I cannot stop it. The obsession of the mind is so much stronger that there is only one thing that's bigger, and it's a power. And if I don't get a power in my life, you know what? My grand sponsor, he stood here so many times. So funny because I wanted to say so badly at this podium. Who motherfuckers flipped the script tonight? Of all nights, this is not our podium. Where did this thing come from? <laughs> I'm so weird. I was thinking, I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to say, my grand sponsor stood here so many times at this podium more than any other podium. It's not this podium. I don't know what. <laughs> I don't even recognize the thing. Anyway, whatever. You know, joke's on me. Abracadabra. Thank you, Houdini. Yeah. I thought that's going to be my line. I'm going to make sure. Because my grand sponsor, Bob Anderson, stood here at the Men's Stag 8 p.m. on Monday for years and years and years and years, pounding this same style of message over and over and over again. And he'd say... I have to repeat myself over and over again because it's a hard message to hear. The subconscious mind won't let me hear it. The untreated alcoholism won't let me hear it. And the ego is not my amigo. So in my home group, we use the Harry Tebow papers. Harry Tebow won the Lasker Award in the back of the big book. And he talks about the untreated infantile aspects of the ego of an alcoholic and that I'm grandiose, I'm defiant, I'm a queen, I'm a baby, I want what I want when I want it, I make plans and then I cancel them at the last minute, I want to play God in my life, I want to play God in your life. You know, I've never been able to stay with a guy for more than a year, but I'm a relationship expert. Come to me with your marriage problems and I'll let you know exactly what I think you should do, you fool. You should actually get celibate and get rid of him or her real fast. I mean. I have no experience, and I have no experience in areas I have no business even trying to talk about. But the ego doesn't want to ask questions. The ego doesn't want to back down. The ego doesn't want to say, you know, I don't know. I don't mind at all today saying I don't know. You know, anyway, as time goes on, if you be a real alcoholic, this thing's going to nail you to the wall. And depression and suicidal ideation. And you know what? I get it. It's an AA meeting, and I speak all over the place, and I don't want to diss Alcoholics Anonymous. But I have some news for you. The landscape of Alcoholics Anonymous has changed dramatically, and drugs are a big part of our story. Yeah. So I can't wipe that out. I mean, there are very few young children walking in with just real alcohol. It's almost non-existent. I don't know, man. They're snorting like cold pills, and I don't know what they're doing. They're chopping up somebody else's psych meds. They're, I don't know what they're doing. They're doing weird things we never did, like, you know. Go, go get some Mad Dog 2020. Get, go, get, go get some Boone's Farm. Go get some vodka. What's the matter with y'all? So alcohol begins to get the worst of me, and like so many of us, we have our lower companions and pick fair-weathered friends, and like I said, I really like black eyes, and I really like restraining orders, and I really like a lot of problems, and yeah, I really like getting kicked out of places. I just actually have no idea how to live in an environment where there's peace. Peace seems boring to an ego like mine. It's just like, wow, quiet people that speak so softly, people that turn the music way down, people that just go for a quiet walk. Like, that looked so stupid to me. Like, I want the volume turned up. So I turn up the volume and turn up the volume and blow up my life over and over and over again, blow up my relationships over and over and over again. The first time I got sober, I went into a rehab. I spun dry for 90 days. 
case, I, I got out and within the first year I got pregnant and decided, I know having a baby is going to keep me sober. And boy, oh boy, did I mean it. But alcoholics mean well, but we can't do well. We are so sure we would pass a lie detector test. Mm, I'm positive this baby is going to save me from ever being an asshole and drinking again. You know, it's complete insanity. It's full flight from reality. Totally full flight from reality. You know, but I got to learn what I got to learn. I've got to learn through my mistakes. I've got to learn through tripping and stumbling and thank God. You know, I loved your whole support group. Like your mom's here, man. Oh man. My mom's 88 and she's a German war survivor. She would never walk into a place like this ever. Uh, no way. You're, it's so cool. And your sponsor and all your people, like that's what it takes. A full blown village, man. You got some good support and you know it. You're thankful for it. You're not just sitting up here. I, I, I like the amount of thanks and, and gratitude that you gave to a whole village of people right on that's what it takes thank god for alcoholics anonymous thank god so first time i got sober i decided having a baby was a lot better idea than going to a bunch of meetings i've already done that in there you know i don't need that anymore and of course you know if you be a real alcoholic that whole thing about it doing push-ups it can be doing push-ups if you don't properly treat your disease i do believe that it will wait you know and 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 it speaks to me with great authority and my mind starts to get twisted and i wake up in the morning with panic attacks and i look at my bank statement too many times in a day and i'm thinking about yesterdays and the tomorrows and i have no ability to one day at a time one moment at a time and i don't know what god is and i've lost my connection i've lost my relationship there is no serenity so i throw my life away and that second time around boy that one was a good one yeah my daughter's like 11 years old wow man i didn't see her for three years so i started drinking and then heroin and crack came into the whole situation and then some people did an intervention that didn't work and then they took my daughter and moved her in with some family friends and then i moved out into the street and i lived on Reseda and i lived on sepulveda i have 23 prostitution cases 18 drug and alcohol related cases i've been in and out of twin towers after it was sybil brand and before it was linwood over and over and over and and over and over every deputy every deputy at van eyes is like not you again what is the matter with you you know every time i go to court you know my last name's how and the judge would say how don't you want drug diversion i'd be like death before detox i'm not fucking going i'm not going you know <laughs> thinking i'm all that and a bag of chips thinking i'm so much smarter stupid your honor yeah like wow but well, this disease to the knees to the knees, jails, institutions. My sister's dying from alcoholism right now as we speak. Her liver's out to here for the last 10 weeks. She hasn't been able to hold food. And I thought, I'm just going to get a little growth. I thought it was diarrhea until she told me yesterday it's vomit, that she can't hold any food down. And I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, this is no bueno. This is really serious. Like diarrhea is one thing. At least it's going in and out. But vomit, like her whole liver, bile, everything is like can't even process anymore. We're all done. And I can see like she's getting wet brain. She can just have two drinks of vodka now and boom, she's like, whoa. And God, for the grace of God, there go I. I mean, I was the hooker in the street and she was the one that always held a job and just drank at night. And she's 18 months older than me and I don't think she's going to make it. I just do not. She's just about ready to turn yellow and I see all that shakiness and wrinkled and dry and dehydration and her brain scattered all over the place. And that is just no place I want to be. I would rather be in here on a Friday night than in her kitchen with an island in the middle doing whatever it is she's doing with her vodka bottles. So I go in and out of jail, all that prostitution stuff. I mean, you know, we already come in here with childhood shame. And then on top of it, all the insane stuff we do in the street. Let me tell you, and especially like people that have dealt with, with coke and meth and things like that. When you have paranoid delusions, those things happened to you. I don't want to minimize your pain. I really don't. Because whether you thought somebody was following you or there were microchips or somebody was under the basement or on the ceiling or in a helicopter, it's no joke when it happens to you. It is the real damn deal. I remember thinking that I could hear my daughter's voice in the back of a car saying, Mom, help me, get me out. And I just go running down the street chasing a car in my insanity. Do you know how scary that is? It still makes me sick inside like my daughter was in the trunk of a car. She wasn't in the trunk of a car, but she really was in the trunk of a car. You guys get what I'm saying. You're nodding. So there's so much that needs to be considered when we come in here because we're a hot, hot, hot mess. And just to um, 
for somebody to ask me what happened the first time you ever drank, for me, it's just not enough. There's so much more wrong with me. I need so much help. I, I'm coming up on 19 years. I still need so much help. I need so much help. I need so much human help every day, so much spiritual help. I talk to alcoholics every day. Me and this message stay this close. Me and Alcoholics Anonymous stay this close, not this close. Not that. I'm woven into it. It's woven into me. It's the biggest part of my life without it. You know, I'm nothing. So I go in and out of jail and in and out of jail and there's this one trick in the street captain save a hoe <laughs> believe it or not for real like i'm gonna get into it like i got a virgin for real i got a virgin from india some young little guy and his mind was so blown with one blow job that he decided he was gonna have to try to save me and he would just go hustling around the streets and all the other hookers would go that guy that little guy is looking for you again that guy in that car in that gray car and every time i would go to jail they would say how whatever my number was you have a visit and I would go and there he'd be behind the glass with his little pocket protector and shit you know are you ready to get out you know oh my god I'm thinking bro are you ready to go to Al-Anon you know anyway the guy tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to save my life anyway I started going in and out of rehab it was in 2003 there was that new uh, police chief, Balka, and he decided, he came from New York, and he decided, I know what we're going to do in L.A. We're going to do something visible so people think that I'm a good police chief. We're going to clean up the street and get rid of all the hookers and get rid of all the crackheads and everybody on the bicycles. And they just began to sting and sting and sting the streets over and over. Handcuffs, 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 to the point where I was so traumatized. I couldn't even take a hit or a drink or anything. The police are now everywhere. They're in everything. I got to get out of here. So I started going into rehabs, revolving door rehab, rehab over and over and over and over and over. And finally, I went to this place out in Indio, California. Somebody gave me some cassette tapes of this guy, Bob Anderson, that started the Monday Night Men's Stag in this room on Monday evenings at 8 o'clock. And no, I'm not a man. I'm a woman. But I still have a lot of respect for the Monday Night Men's Stag because this guy carried a bomb-ass message. And I listened to these tapes, and he said, the main part of the illness centers in the alcoholic's mind rather than her body. You're going to be the same woman drunk as you are sober. And if the main part of the illness centers in your mind rather than your body, then all of your thoughts are infected with untreated alcohol and the calls are coming from inside the house. You are the self-manufacturer of your own misery. And I'm just like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> I just couldn't believe. I just couldn't. Like, my top of my head was blown off. I'm the breeder of confusion, not harmony. I love this is one of my favorite Bill Wilson ones. A self-imposed crisis. I want a t-shirt, okay? I just want one. I want a t-shirt with a circle and an A and an A and on the back. Self-imposed crisis. I'm a self-imposed crisis. I don't have anything else because I don't have any tools. So I continue to do the same things over and over again that I always did, drunk or sober. I'm going to hate you the way I hate you. She said respond instead of react. Right on, man. You're getting really good recovery over there. That's it. Back the fuck down. Put a space in between it the most successful recovery in this room is not the person with the most time it's the person with the fastest brake pedal that's what I'm trying to do here is just man you know stop just stop you know check myself before I wreck myself slow down turbo I don't need to say it I don't need to open my mouth I don't need to tell everyone what I think is wrong with them I'm always looking outside and you know what this whole program is about self-reflection it's about self-honesty it's about about self-sacrifice. It's about allowing a power greater than self to operate through self so that I can be a channel for God. And so what happens is I become stronger. I really do. I become stronger with God. And even maybe my alphaness, my strongness becomes an asset. I don't want to pound your face anymore. I really do want to love you. I want to hug you deeper. I really hope the best for you. You know, when I have attitude or when I have a bad opinion, I know I'm in it. And so badly I want to offer it back to divine order. I don't want to live in untreated alcoholism. I don't want to be in hell. So I start really looking at my thoughts. And like that Bob Anderson guy would say, you know, 
that it's in my mind. It's in my mind, and it's going to be in my mind forever unless I allow a power into my mind. How do I do that? Step two is very easy to understand, but it's not always easy to do. So when I come to believe that there's a power greater than self that can restore me, greater than self that can restore me, I have to see there's two parts to step one. I'm powerless over alcohol or pick your poison, porn, chocolate cake, cutting, meth, pills, whatever it is, powerless over dash. Don't get stuck in the dash. Don't get stuck in the dash. My life is unmanageable. It's up here and it's down here and I don't even know it. I wake up in hell and I've never even examined my own thought life. I just think I know everything until I really start to look at my thought life and I can see that I can't stop the thoughts. I'm being sunk, being sunk by a parasite. I'm being sunk, I'm going to say it, by a demon. I really am. I'm being sunk by a demon. I know some of you get it. I can't get away from it. I can't get it off of me. The only solution is not crack or alcohol or vodka or sex or anything else. It's a spiritual solution. And I begin to talk to the power. I begin to use God to interrupt the present moment. And I look at this power as the great, interrupter i need an interrupter i choose to call god power can you protect me from my mind can you help me drive my car and not their car can you help me in starbucks you know what is this lady she gets up to the front and she's had 30 minutes what's the difference between a venti and a grande and a this and a hang- nah, nah. <laughs> bitch i'm gonna fucking shoot you what's the matter with you <laughs> come on and then in the end you know what actually can i just have a cup of water and i think one <laughs> you know and i'm the one that should be so grateful i'm even standing in the starbucks line but i got so much opinion and so much rage and so much attitude because what right under my breath i use the c word or or people are clowns i was one of my ladies clowns these fucking circus these clowns you know i get to be sick all day long calling everyone a clown right below the surface i'm not allowing them to be part of the human race i get in the car and i'm like i fucking hate traffic loot all this traffic astrid you are traffic there's somebody right behind me that hates traffic too I am the line, but I'm the last one to know it, you know? Very sad, this disease. It, you know, for real, you know what? I'm an actor running all over the place. I want to direct this whole planet. If y'all would just listen to me, I've got better ideas. I am so out of ideas. Please leave it to somebody else. The greatest thing that we can do is rewire our neural pathways. And I love when somebody said now and the guy goes, right now, who's the right now guy? Where's the right now guy? I love the right now guy. Anyway, little little peeper. Yeah, that's right. You know, and it is right now. So here's the deal. Ready? I'm sure I've got like five seconds left. The only time I can treat this disease is in the present moment. The only time I can have a relationship with God is in the present moment. When am I going to do this? When? If I'm not doing it now, tomorrow, next week, next year. What am I doing in all my right nowness is? My right nowness is are the only place I can insert the sunlight of the spirit. Now, this is going to sound really crazy. I was listening to this um, spiritual neuroscientist the other day, and he said the weirdest thing, but I got it. He said partial possession Entities from the outside enter in between the space of the thought and the neuron. And I was like, I feel the truth in that. That's why I have to continue to insert light into the space between the thought and the neuron. Real light. Do you know your body and your mind can make light? Do you believe that? You feel the truth in that, right? That's a real truth. That's not bullshit. We can make light. I can make bigger light. I can walk into a room and I know I'm cool and I'm treated and I feel so high and so loving that all the doors and windows are going to open and things are going to go my way and I'm in the zone. And I can either put myself in the chaos zone where I hit every red light and I hate everybody and everything goes wrong, or I can put myself in the zone where there's form. 
and there isn't chaos and everything begins to align with God's will. The fourth dimension for me anyway is a real place. I have a God of parking spaces. I'm sorry if you guys had to park eight park streets down there. I have a true God of parking spaces. I have a God of go to a, a fancy hotel and they say, we're sorry, your one room is out and we're going to give you the $1,500 suite even though you only paid <laughs> chump change. Yeah, right on the beach and you open the windows and there's the water. I have that kind of God. I have that God and it's a big part of my belief system. So if you get into the double helix energy of the heart mind, it goes out in a 40 foot radius. It actually mimics the sun's energy, even though the sun's energy goes out much further and then it pulls itself back in and then it pulls itself back in. And the heart mind does the same thing. So when I walk into a room and I'm like, I get a really bad vibe from that person. I actually start to use that because I'm building my intuition with God, but I'm also emanating and I'm sending something out there. I don't want to give people bad vibes anymore. I want to at least be placed in a position of neutrality. I don't want somebody all crazy to walk in here with a loaded gun and blow me away or anybody else, you know, and I do believe we can vibrate at a higher enough frequency that I don't know, maybe we're the one person that walks out of Chernobyl or a mass shooting or a car accident. You know, anything's possible. Miracles are possible. We see them every day when we are awake to the present moment and God makes that possible. The plugged in connection to the fourth dimension. This is a spiritual program. It's a spiritual plan of action. This is not a church. I can say fuck and God in the same sentence all I want. And you know what? Nobody's going to tell me I can't. It's my internal relationship with God. You know, I'm grateful to be here. I love this room. I spend a lot of time in this room. I'm here every Saturday night. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be here tomorrow night at 730. I'm going to be sitting right over there hanging out with the secretary and we have a bomb ass speaker here tomorrow night. And if you miss Saturday night, you can hit the men's stag in here on Monday at eight o'clock or the women's meeting downstairs on Monday at 730. I'm so excited. I'm so happy. I have wanted this gig. I've spoken globally everywhere. I have wanted this gig for like 12 years. And I remember this Dr. Armand, he goes, they said they don't want you. They said primetime isn't AA. They're not going to let you speak there. And I live right across the street. I can walk home and I'm like, damn, fucking Dickens. Dickens, <laughs> Dickens fucking Friday night says, I'm not AA. Come on. Anyway, you guys fulfilled a dream for me. I really, I mean that. I'm eternally grateful for this particular pitch, for this particular podium. I'm on fire. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.